Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Our Father's Word, how fantastic it is. You know, the last chapter documented the crucifixion, the burial, and um, the resurrection. And this chapter is kind of written to, um, to those of God's elect, especially here in the end times. I'll document that in a moment. As we come to chapter 54, the great book of Isaiah, Isaiah meaning in the Hebrew tongue, Yahweh's salvation. That's God's way of salvation for you. Chapter 54, verse 1, and it reads, um, with that word of wisdom from our Father in Yeshua's name, Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear, break forth into singing, and cry aloud that thou didst not travail with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. Now, this would be a little confusing to some if you did not understand that our Father is speaking spiritual here. He's speaking to those that he called before the foundations of this world, basically. And he's, this is why it was written in Mark 13, Woe to those that are with child when I return, and those that give suck. Meaning, spiritually impregnated with the false Christ, and actually nursing along his work. And, and um, those that remain barren, that's to say, wait for the true husband. He even calls them wife, and you know that he considers a wedding even from the first earth age, if you want to go that far. If you don't, put it on the shelf over here and reread chapter 19, verses 7 and 8 of the great book of Revelation. But our Father loves his children. And what he's saying here, sing and celebrate if you're one of those that didn't get drawn into the false marriage of the false Christ and his false teaching. And again, it's a blessing for a mother to conceive and bear a child. Always has been, always will be. As a matter of fact, God told people to replenish the earth way back in Genesis chapter 1. But spiritually speaking, it's a totally different connotation. You know, it should remind you of Christ's words as he was carrying that cross up the hill to Golgotha with the crown of thorns and the blood dripping. What did Christ say? The women were crying by the, by the um, path as he went up to that hill. And he was thinking of the generation that would wait for him at his return. Listen to it. I'm going to read it to you. You won't have it. Luke chapter 23, verse 28. But Jesus turning unto them, these daughters of Jerusalem, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. That's to say generation to generation. For behold, the days are coming in the which they shall say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bear and the paps that never gave suck. In other words, that waited for the true Messiah. Then shall they begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us and to the hills, cover us. That's when they realized they worshiped the false Christ at the true Christ return. For if they do these things to a green tree, in other words, if they do this to the Messiah, Jesus Christ, when he's in the flesh and blood runs in his veins, what shall be done in the dry? What are they going to do with the spirit? They're going to fall off and worship the Antichrist, most of them are. And what are they going to cry? I'm not a widow, I'm a queen. <clears throat> and old sister Babylon and all those that are deceived by the false Christ will give that cry. And guess what happens when the true Christ returns, just as he warned? <clears throat> Spiritually barren until the true husband returns. No marriage till then. Spiritually speaking, verse 2 of uh, chapter 54, the great book of Isaiah, let's go with it. Enlarge the place of thy tent. This is the ones that are barren. And let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitation. 
spare not, and lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes. In other words, you were barren, but you're going to be so blessed, and so many are going to be converted. You're going to have to enlarge that, <clears throat> your tent, and, and your house, in other words, because to hold them. There's going to be so many. And of course, naturally, when you look forward to that first day of the millennium, when Christ returns, every knee is going to bow to him. Every knee. They won't stay that way, but they will when they realize they've been had. You do not want to be caught in that trap of not having studied God's word to know the difference between the true and the false, your true husband and the fake. Verse 3. For thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left, and thy seed shall inherit, or to rule the Gentiles, that should be translated nations, and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. In other words, um, the nations are going to come forth. Again, every knee bowing to the true Messiah, King of kings, Lord of lords, the only government there will be at that time. Verse 4, fear not. For thou shalt not be ashamed. You're not going to be praying for mountains to fall on you. You stay true. Neither be thou confounded. Don't you be confused. For thou shalt not be put to shame. For thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth and shalt not remember the reproach of thy widowhood anymore. In other words, the fact that Christ was gone. And... and um, and this should remind you, and you should make a note of Revelation chapter 18, verse 7, where the old sister harlot, the, the uh, sister Babylon, says, I'm not a widow. I'm a queen. And the false Christ supports her, pays her bills, teaches her falsely, and she loves every minute of it. False religion, false teaching, it's a dangerous thing to go against the word of the living God. For God has forewarned us chapter by chapter, verse by verse, trump by trump, seal by seal, vial by vial, exactly how it goes down in the end times. And you have, have you ever read it? You know, anytime Christ was answered to qu ask a question, he would say, haven't you read? In other words, it's written, it's all right here. Why haven't you read it? <clears throat> so there you have it. Uh, so remain true to the true Father. Okay. Verse 5. Who do you remain true to? Let's read it in verse 5. For thy maker is thine husband. Well, who made you? Well, the living God did. He created your soul. The Lord of hosts is his name. And thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. In other words, he's the nearest kin you've got, and he's kinsman Redeemer. The God of the whole earth shall he be called. In other words, universal dominion. He picked Jerusalem. He, he wed her. He made a covenant with her in Ezekiel chapter 16. It's his favorite place, not only in the world, but the universe. And that's where he intends to establish the eternal heaven. And he shall return. The full Godhead will not return de jure until the end of the millennium. But the Son returns on the first day of the millennium, which is called the Lord's Day. How long is the Lord's Day? Well, as it is written in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, Be not ignorant of this thing, for one day with the Lord is as a thousand years with man. In other words, it's a thousand years, meaning the Lord's day is the millennium. It's that time of teaching. The time that many that have never had an opportunity to hear the truth, they're going to be taught. Well, are you talking about a second chance with some, what's being taught by some people? Some of them don't have a prayer of a chance. Because they won't study on their own. They won't study for themselves. There shouldn't be any great mystery to that verse. Our husband is our maker. That's the true. Don't be sold a bill of goods and wed out of season. 
and be spiritually impregnated, that means in your mind, by false teachings to worship the false Messiah. His message, I've come to fly you away. A lot of people are going to believe that. And that's real sad because they were forewarned in the Word of God exactly. Seal by seal, trump by trump, and vial by vial. In the great book of Revelation, exactly line on line as to how it would go down. See that you, one of God's elect, those that he thought of as he was carrying that cross up to Golgotha, to Calvary, weep not for me, but weep for those that are, um, that, um, uh, are with child. Blessed are those that are barren, those that wait for me that wait for my return. Verse 7, I'm sorry, verse uh, 6. For the Lord hath called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit and a wife of youth when thou wast refused, saith thy God. In other words, um, it, you may, this is the, during the great apostasy, you may feel you're abandoned if you're not careful. But if you know God's word, uh, you won't, you, you're wasting your time if you feel that way because God promises, I will never leave thee nor will I forsake thee. But for that one little period of time, the apostasy, that's, that's the falling away. That's when the false Christ returns and the world whores after him, okay, thinking he's the true Jesus, performing miracles in the sight of people, <clears throat> excuse me, that deceives the world. Boy, is he going to be accepted by those that are unlearned. But you're not unlearned. Do you know the word of God? And you believe the word of God and you follow the word of God. Verse 7, listen carefully. For a small moment have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. It may seem like I've abandoned you. In other words, he's got to give the false Christ that little bit of time. But that's when you shine. That's what your destiny is. As it is written in Mark 13, that's when you're delivered up and you allow the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the, the spirit he mentioned in, in Luke 23, what will they do with this, um, the uh, tree with the blood running in the vein? What will they do with my body and the spirit, the Holy Spirit? You're going to allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you. You're not going to whore around with the false Christ. And you will do exploits as it's written in the 11th chapter of the great book of Daniel simply standing your ground and allowing the Holy Spirit to speak. That's destiny, my friend. And what a privilege to serve the living God. Verse 8, in a little wrath, just a little bit of anger, God is saying, righteous indignation, I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord thy Redeemer, the one that saves you, the one that redeems you over and over when you fall short. Why, he loves you. He's your father. He is so very, very proud and, and shows kindness toward those that see the truth, that care, that want to please him that want to stand against the false one. The controversy is between Satan and Almighty God. Which side do you choose? Do you listen to the traditions of men that make void the word of God? Or do you listen to your father? The choice is yours. There, the, what he's saying is there may be seemingly to some just a little rough moment there, but hey, bring it on. We're, we're can-do type people. We can cut it. Why? Because we know that God has given us power as that same book of great Luke, St. Luke, in chapter 10, verse 18, he gave us power over all of our enemies in the name of Jesus Christ. So we don't have to worry about those things. We can cut it. We can get it done. And we will not disappoint the Father. 
And that brings many blessings. Do you know what his reward is for that? Not tomorrow, but today. Verse 9. For this is as the waters of Noah unto me. This is your father speaking. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth, so have I sworn that I would not be wroth with thee, nor rebuke thee. You can count on it. In Genesis chapter 9, verse 13, what did he promise? He gave us a sign. He said, every time you see it, remember that. It's a rainbow. Every time you see the rainbow, it's God's promise that he will never flood this earth with water again. Satan's going to try it. But every time you see a rainbow, it's a promise to you that God is never going to be angry or wroth with you. That he loves you. And he shows that kindness to you. And it is everlasting. You know, in hard times, you need to know this. And you need to never forget it. That it's a promise from God. And do you remember what he said back in chapter 43, verse 26? He said, hey, remind me of the promises I have made you and let's talk about it. Well, do that. That's, that's a condition. Remind him of the promises and talk to God about it. Talk to your father about it. But this, this is a powerful promise that he has made us. Us who? You that remain barren when the false Christ comes. You that will not be taken in by a false Messiah, but will love the living God with all your heart, mind, body, and soul, and spirit, to love he that will never forsake you nor leave you. And every time you see that rainbow today, it's placed there as a promise from God that he will never flood the earth again, but also for you, the barren, spiritually speaking, you that stay true, that stay true to the seals, the trumps, and the vials. That's to say the word of God. It's his promise that he'll never be angry with you. When God's tribulation comes and hailstones are falling on this earth, if you're right in the middle of it, you don't have to worry. He'll protect you. He'll guard you. You can count on it. It's his promise. And, and I'll, I'll use it again, just as the three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when they were in that fiery furnace, Christ walked with them and they weren't singed. So it is for you in the fiery trials of, all the, of the end times of Satan's. You don't have to worry. God has given you the rainbow, the promise. Talk to him about it. Claim it. Verse 10. For the mountain shall depart. <clears throat> At the end, he's going to shake things up. And the hills be removed. But my kindness shall not depart from thee. Neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed. Saith the Lord that hath mercy on thee. That covenant is eternal. That covenant is everlasting. That promise that he made concerning the rainbow will always be. Remember it. Stay true. And never, I mean, even, uh, even when the tribulations and the shaking, you see, if you're on Christ, you're on a rock that can't be shaken anyway. So when the end comes, you don't have to worry. That's what he's saying here. Verse 11, O thou afflicted, tossed with tempest, and not comforted, behold, I will lay thy stones with fair colors, and lay thy foundations with sapphires. He's quoting here from Revelation 21, 18, where he's talking about his election and how that he, that he brings all this in. Do you, you know what colors is in, in the Hebrew? It's makeup. I'm gonna, you're going to look good. And I'm, we're not literally speaking that, in other words, it's going to be beautiful where you're at, spiritually speaking, all right? Even though he uses the word makeup here, um, uh, stibium. Okay. Verse 12. 
And I will make thy windows of agates and thy gates of carbuncles and all thy borders of pleasant stones. Again, you can read of this in that final chapter where the earth is rejuvenated and we go into that eternity in Revelation 21, 18. You want to be there? Or do you want to be in that other place? It's called the lake of fire. You don't want to be there. Verse 13. And all thy children shall be taught of the Lord. And great shall be the peace of thy children. You know when this happens? It's in the millennium. And a lot of people will say, well, I didn't know there would be any teaching in the millennium. Well, God says there will be. Why wouldn't you believe him? That's what it's about. You know, the traditions of men so make void the word of God that very few people even have the opportunity to hear the real word of God taught in this generation. They have removed him from the schools and they wonder why they have shootings of children shooting each other up in schools. You take God out of their environment, you know something? That's the only place many children even heard of God was prayers in school. And it set the morals and the standards in this nation. We didn't have school shootings back then. Well, weren't there guns? Yes, there were guns, but we had morals. We taught children morals. We don't do that anymore. And that's what you have. They will be taught in the millennium. Discipline and order. Verse 14, in righteousness shall thou be established. You can, that doing what's right. Thou shalt be far from oppression. We're going to get rid of um, anxieties. For thou shalt not fear and from terror. For it shall not come near thee. In other words, there will be no terrorists there. They'll be somewhere else. Okay. They surely won't be there. So you don't have to, this is a promise from God. You can count on it. Verse 15, behold, they shall surely gather together. They're going to come against you, but not by me. God said, I'm not the one that gathers them. Well, who is then? Satan, of course. Wickedness. Whosoever shall gather together against thee shall fall for thy sake. Why? Because God's with us. Any weapon that is brought against us will fall. It will fail. Why? Because God is with us. He promised it. He said it. I believe it. Our Father is faithful to those that truly bring forth His Word, the truth, unadulterated in the traditions of man unvarnished with false teachings, but the pure, open truth. They, they, he says, what, what he's saying is, there'll be some people talk against you, but that's okay. I didn't bring them, but I'll take care of them. That's what he's saying. And indeed he shall. Verse 16. Behold, I have created the smith that bloweth the coals in the fire and that bringeth forth an instrument for his work. And I have created the waster to destroy. Do you understand that God is saying, I created the waster to destroy? He's saying, I created Satan. Well, of course he did. He created everything. Satan went bad. And many people say, well, that kind of shakes me up. Well, no, you should, it shouldn't. What God is saying I made it all. I'm in charge. I'm in control. There are certain things I will let him waste, and there is a line. It won't be you. I will prevent him if he comes against you. But what it does, it gives you the strength of your spiritual husband, which is God, the Redeemer, and the Creator of all things, including the wicked. So, if God owns their souls, his souls are his are his soul their souls belong to God for God to do with as he chooses and sees right and that's why the lake of fire will have company. Verse 
Verse 17, listen carefully and learn from God's word. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. Now, now I, I want you to absorb that. How many, how many of the weapons can prosper against us? No. Zero. Nada. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. It may waddle along and it may look bad, but it's not going to prosper. And every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. You can count on it. Now listen, I don't want you to read over something that was in that verse. Because many would say, did you hear that? Any tongue that rises against us, God's going to judge and do away with. That's not what it said. It's not what it said at all. Well, let's go back and see what it said. It said, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment, thou, you, you shall condemn. So, you see, it takes a little work on your part. Christ, in that great 10th chapter of the great book of St. Luke, in the 18th verse, as I forementioned in this, own, this same lecture, gave you power over all of your enemies. You condemn them. And that's why you can boldly go forth and criticize and condemn those that would mock or come against the word of the living God. You don't, you have nothing to worry about, nothing, no weapon that goes against the very works of God concerning the end time that leads up to the millennium can prosper against God's elect, God's wife, those that, um, that God chose before the foundations of this world that he can trust. He knows them. Why? Because they stood against Satan in the first earth age. Only one third of the children fell off to Satan in the first earth age. Revelation chapter 12, verse 4. You didn't if you're one of God's elect. Whereby Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4 says, I chose you before the foundations of the earth. Meaning the word in the noun is katabo, the overthrow of Satan in the first earth age. I chose you then. Why, why, well, why would God choose you? Because you earned it. He doesn't give free rides. You earn it. So uh, this is a fantastic chapter, this 54th chapter. Christ remembered them when he was kept walking up that hill to Golgotha to pay the price. And the price he paid, we collect in the very next chapter, chapter 55. Chapter 55 is given by invitation for those that love him and those that truly do love him. And we thank our Father for that. Chapter 55, verse 1. Ho, every one that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. And he that hath no money, come ye buy and eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Well, how is it that you can buy it without money? Because you have to know what kind of wine and milk he's talking about the milk of grace, the wine, the blood of Christ that washes away all of your sins, and water, the living water, that once you partake of it, which is to say Christ, the truth, you never thirst again. The reason you don't buy it with money is he paid the price on the cross. He, it, it's not free. It cost an awesome price. He that wore that crown of thorns, he that carried that cross, and he that said to the daughters of Jerusalem as he was going up to be crucified to pay this price, don't weep for me. Weep for yourselves. 
Blessed are those that are barren when he returns, of course. He's the one that paid the price. And when you recognize the fact that he did pay that price, then you know and understand that our Heavenly Father loves us, appreciates us, and certainly we uh, can share in that love and that understanding the fact that he would never, never uh, abandon us nor forsake us and that nothing that ever prosper, that w any weapon that comes against us would never prosper. This is by invitation. God has his election, but this is whomsoever will, meaning that will believe, that will know that he paid that price. Um, and uh, he or she that has ears to hear. Verse 2, wherefore, wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread? And your labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me. You listen closely to me. And eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight, not your body, but your soul delight itself in fatness. Uh, I don't know how many times have you gone to a church where you weren't fed, where it didn't satisfy. Why, why did you spend your money where it didn't satisfy? Where it just plunked. No truth there. No life. Truth comes from the living word. There is no substitute for the blood of Christ. There is no substitute for the truth. That truth is precious. That truth is the word of our father, our husband. I don't know. It is up to you as to which side you choose and whether you want freely that that he has paid for or if you want secondhand hand-me-downs from that will never satisfy it's your choice. He sent you the letter. It's yours to read and accept. I hope you do. Don't miss the next lecture. All right, bless your hearts. You listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD.